here. Um, first thing I want to do though is introduce you to our judges. So we had a couple judges, even though they don't really have to do any judging tonight. Um, but I still want to introduce them because they're two great people. Um, one of our judges, I'm, I'm really excited to say, one of our judges is our executive deputy director, Roberto Arpagania. This is Roberto. Everyone say hey to Roberto. And, uh, all right, are you, can you hear me over there on that side? Oh, um, awesome. Thanks so much. So I'd like to introduce you to Roberto. He's going to tell you a little bit about um, what he does and also a little bit about what one of our departments is doing. So take it away, Roberto. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So wonderful to have you here. And um, just really appreciate everyone who came out tonight and who's going to be sharing their stories and their words. Um, I have to say, this is one of my favorite events that we do here at the center. I really want to appreciate Sam um, and Alex and Rosemary and our entire community programs team. Um, you know, here at the center, we have over 200 events each month. Um, and many of them get put on by the center and our partner agencies. Um, and really appreciate all of the support that we get from volunteers who make events like this possible. Um, it's a really exciting year. We are growing many different programs to help um, young people get off the streets, to help folks that are looking for jobs and looking for housing um, and looking for um, the opportunity to small, start their own small businesses to get some support from the center. So, you know, I would encourage you all to check out our website and know that we're actually going to be launching a new website in the spring at ssfcenter.org and get more um, in contact with us. We're here to both help you and support you, but then also to celebrate, right, our amazing queer identities, um, our amazing racial identities, um, and really have a space where we can all connect with each other and support each other and be stronger and healthier. And I think it's more important than ever before um, as we are living in the realities of this wacky and horrible political environment to be together and to build community um, and to advocate for the most vulnerable people in our community. And we can't do that without it. So, so um, on this special Valentine's Day, let's continue to love each other and love ourselves and, and just welcome to the center if this is your first time. So enjoy the night. Yay, thank you so much, Roberto. Thank you so much. Okay, um, our next judge, is Bruce Bedette, this lovely red person over here. And um, Bruce is now one of the SF board member, SF Pride board member. So I don't know if any of you know, uh, there is an organization that uh, actually makes Pride happen. And that organization is working on Pride all year long. And I'm very fortunate to be a board member at Pride. This is my third year. And I'm really excited that Bruce uh, came in this year, got voted in this year, and now he will be on as well for three years. Um, and we're very happy that you're with us, Bruce. And thank you for being here tonight as well. So let's all give a round of applause to Bruce, please. Thank you, Bruce. So, um, my first Pride was not my first year, because I got there a little bit late, the first year in 1978. Um, I arrived in San Francisco a month before Jonestown happened. Um, that, that thing went, went, which a whole bunch of people ended up dead from San Francisco and Jonestown. And Harvey Milk and George Moscone also, that happened in that Pride this year at the age of 19. Um, I, I've had the good fortune through the years of having a lot of folk intersect with my life and impact me in like really positive <coughs> ways which have made me feel better as a queer person. You know, lots of just really cool people. I, mean, I was talking upstairs to a, a gentleman at the front desk about how I got in a car one time after the uh, Pink Triangle event and I ended up in the back seat with somebody and I misunderstood what they were telling me the person had done. And I said, oh, the person made the 
the banner for the transgender march. And the two people in the front seat said, no, the person you're sitting next to made the transgender flag. And I love history, and I love that kind of thing, and I just like turned into like a total, like, oh my god, I need to get a picture with you, you're so cool. And her flag is now in the, trans the you know, that transgender flag that we all know, is now in the Smithsonian Museum. Wow. Uh, there's a queer collection there. And uh, I just, I've been around queer history forever. Um, more recently, I've been interested in focusing on you know, sort of the, the big elephant in the room that for a long time uh, queer history was promoted, supported, pushed by affluent white gay men. And they kind of went to their own comfort zone and promoted white gay men. But there's been so many incredible contributions. When I was in this room trying to get elected to the board, um, I had first went that day to the magazine up on Market Street and purchased two magazines from 1963. Uh, one of the two magazines had James Baldwin on the cover, uh, gay, proud, and black, and the other one had Bayard Rustin. And Bayard Rustin was the man who came up with the idea to throw the 1963 march on Washington for death and freedom. And so I think it's really important that, that we you know, teach everybody their history and celebrate you know, ways for people to develop their self-esteem in the same way that I did through you know, the old boy doing it with rich white gay men running through them. So, anyways, so Ray and I and other people are interested in also sharing the richness and the diversity of our communities um, at SF Pride and throughout the year. And we're going to different events in the community throughout the year as well. We we're I was just at the uh, Bates Powwow, uh, Two Spirit Powwow, which is their word for GLBTQ2. Um, at Fort Mason, and so it's, it's, a, it's a cool world out there. Besides the negative stuff that ever happens, we're a cool, loving community of neat, interesting, smart people. And yeah, that part. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much, Bruce. Um, Bruce, I was wondering if uh, maybe you can like grace us with your style here and come up front here. Um, and, and you know, I, I just realized that you did something to me that you are a poet. So yes. I'm wondering if you'd like to share your a poem with us. But definitely after you show us that great outfit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I like to tell you, but I remember when I first met you, Bruce, it's like, you know, and, and especially like, this is definitely not negative, don't take it negatively, but you know, in our community we do have a, a lot of white men, and how do, how do I like remember every single white man that I meet? And I love it because Bruce was like, my name's Bruce, colorful Bruce. And I was like, hello Bruce, nice to meet you, I will never forget you, so thank you so much for that. So when I first started being great about celebrating poetry, and um, then I found that uh, I was drawn to color, and so I moved out of that into artwork, and then eventually landing in costuming, and uh, I make costumes for different events like Gay Pride and Folsom and stuff. Um, but being that there was only one poet here tonight, I thought, well, wait, I have an album full of poetry, much of which I'm not going to read. <laughs> I don't like what they like that. Um, but I'll read this one. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we'd like for you to keep it rated R. Yes. Don't feel any further than that. So I, I, I was inspired as by as were other people like Ernest Hemingway by an incredible talent named Gertrude Stein, uh, who was from Oakland and who moved with her brother to Paris uh, and lived a long time with her partner partner Alice B. Toklas. And in uh, the Bay Area, there's two political parties that are democratic. One is the Alice B. Toklas party, and one is the Harvey Milk. So anyways, that's that history. Um, but here's the poem. <laughs> Wayne and the Elephant Walk. And just a little background. Um, at the corner of Victor and Castro, there's a bar called Harvey's. Uh, when I first moved to San Francisco, the Elephant Walk was the name of that particular establishment, which on the night of the White Night riots, when we protested Dan White getting off 
very lightly for the crime of killing Harvey Milk in George Monks County. We protested at, protested at City Hall um, by the end of the night. Somewhere between 14 and 19 police cars were on fire. Um, lots of windows smashed at City Hall. Uh, afterwards, the police went to Castro. Uh, we're trying to find some place to sort of mend their energy. Uh, the elephant block, as is Harvey still, is a very easy thing to get into. And they went in and just tore the place up. Uh, injured people, broke windows, broke tables. You know, a great deal of damage happened to the elephant block. But it was a place where Sylvester James uh, and lots of other people performed as well. And a you know, place of joy as well. And there was this guy named Wayne. Uh, Wayne and the elephant walk. Walk and the elephant. And Wayne, who is one who is fun to watch walk. Who is fun? Wayne. And to drink is to drink freshly squeezed orange juice. Is to drink, who is one? Wayne is, who is one who serves Concord Gray? Walk and the elephant smile. His smile is to drink, is to see his white teeth. Walk, and who is the elephant? Not Wayne. The waiter, who is the waiter? Later, he is the man who is Wayne. Hard life, hard life, is his life. Whose life? His life. He is a man who is Wayne, who is fun to watch walk. so much for that, Bruce. That was lovely. Um, all right, well, now I'm going to introduce to you our MC. Uh, if some of you have been here before, then you know Alex. If some of you haven't, then I'd like to introduce to you Alex. Alex is one of our volunteers and um, one of the creative minds of the Queer Slam. So everyone, please put your hands together for Alex. <laughs> Tonight. Thank you for being here on Valentine's Day. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you to the LGBT Center's Valentine's edition of Queer Slam. Um, so as you've been informed, tonight's going to look a little different than usual, but I'm excited to see what happens. Um, so my name is Alex and I identify as hella queer and you can use they them pronouns to refer to me. And tonight, obviously, I'm sharing the stage with DJ Gray and all the wonderful performers and judges tonight. Um, um, for your safety, emergency exits are located on your left, and the bathrooms are located on the left-hand side of the elevators and are gender neutral. And so we're having a poet tonight, and her name is Anna Allen. She's a returning performer here at Queer Slam. And, um, her work is frequently about consumption, loss, race, and queer love as a radical act. So please give a warm welcome to Anna. Or, or bills to pay, but you know what? I want to trade it 
for a week of nothing but Friday, she amazes me. And me? Well, I fuck with the lights on. <laughs> I'm so terrified of things that I can't see. I do everything so carefully. I, I tucked my moth-ridden heart into yards of bubble wrap, mustering up the bravado to ask her to let me make her coffee every morning. I, I do it perfectly. When she left me, it was like lightning destroying this perfect sky, like no clean water in a flood, like falling on gravel, skinning your palms, like choking on your own tongue. She says, when it hits you, after you pulled the needle from your vein, it feels like clear traffic on the freeway, like a hug from your mother, like towels from the dryer, like marshmallows over a fire, you just die. This small death, and then it's over. I miss watching her smile, lazy, like a cat in the sunlight. I miss strolling my fingers up the bumps of her spine. She plays me like a piano. She throws me as far as the eye can see. She loves as hard as a 40-hour work week. She just doesn't love me. And it's like that sometimes. It's like that. And then, and then, and then, she says, 
I was flirting with the girl at the grocery store, or I wore a bitchy tone that looked awful on me, or my smile when she walked in the front door wasn't traffic light bright enough, and the wheel would spin again, and the cycle would begin, and I'd end up on the hardwood floor again. Is it true? But they say about dreams. Will my grip on her strands of hair loosen a bit every day? And what of this nightmare? I wouldn't mind this exorcism. I wouldn't mind this forgetting. I wouldn't mind this loosening. My fear has boiled over, sizzling when refugees hit the stove top, smelling of charred milk and her. Every day there is a little less. Every day I am a little more. I said, it must be great to be able to work with your hands. 
And he said, well, no, you don't usually lie here. I'm a police officer. It was at this moment I said, wait, hang on, are you Nick? And he said, no, I'm Nick. Aww. Lesson learned, the importance of enunciation. <laughs> <laughs> FYI, I never met Nick. I think he left. <laughs> a year later, 2009, I decided I wouldn't date because previous knowledge had taught me maybe I'd best avoid it. So instead I went to a party, it was a Valentine's Day party in a very old London club where if you wore shoes as white as these, they would come out black after 30 minutes. And at the corner of my eye, at about midnight, I see someone gyrating on the balcony above me. And I look up, I wave, and they wave back. And I think, great, we're already on waving terms. This is going well. And then he starts shouting something, but it's a nightclub, so I can't hear a single word. I start doing this, and then I start doing this, which as we all know is an international sign for, I don't understand. And then in a sheer moment of genius and romanticism, he plucks from his pocket a pen and one of those candy love hearts, and he writes his phone number on the back of the love heart, and then leans over and drops it, where it ricochets off my face <laughs> with a crimson trail and land somewhere on the disgusting floor. Lesson two, gravity is not always your friend. <laughs> However, the third thing that happened, which was the good thing, 2010, and I met the man that is now my husband. Which is a good thing, yes. So that's the evidence for maybe good things don't come in trees, but maybe sometimes it does. So I have three evidence three pieces of evidence that I love my husband. And these are things that he has done, and yet still I love him. <laughs> <laughs> On my first birthday, we were in a restaurant. The restaurant brought me out a cake. It was a beautiful piece of confectionery, lots of chocolate work, lots of chocolate twills, and the top of a single white candle, which I blew out, cut out from the side. I started cutting the cake up so that we could enjoy some. However, the other chance of it he is, he thought he'd sneak in and steal some of the food before I could get a chance. And quick as a flash, before I could say, no don't, he stole the white chocolate twill from the plate and put it into his mouth and started chewing. And then realised it was the candle. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I continued to take them. Then there was the time when we visited friends in the north, when we were crossing a beautiful river with stepping stones. And someone said, hey Chris, and he turned and he fell and slashed half his face open. And still, I love Scarface, as we now call him. <laughs> but the last thing, which is relatively recent, and I think must show the true affection I feel for this man, was at a very important business dinner to which he was attending. He was talking to a colleague on his right, somebody he was trying to impress. And the dinner had not yet come out, so he thought, oh, I'll enjoy some of the appetizers on the table. He looked over and thought, ah, with some of peas, I'll quickly have one of those. Picked it up, popped it in his mouth. And after the first chew, he realised it wasn't a wasabi pea, but it was in fact the pit from an olive that his colleague had just spat out. <laughs> but, ever the true businessman, he swallowed it and carried on as if nothing had happened. So there you go. Threes, good and bad. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. Give Sam a warm round of applause for sharing the story about your husband and their very interesting love. Um, and please welcome back to the stage. We're going to have Anna back on stage to share more poetry. Give a warm welcome for Anna. Solidarity. 
for the soil swallowed my limbs whole, to return me to the mother I came from. I thought of water, of floating on your backside, those crystallized drops clinging to Negro hair like diamonds, making us look holy, divine. For a few seconds, there is no wait. On the day I kissed the floor of the Tallahatchie River and received nothing but a mouthful of black tar, I noted that fists and kicks from steel-toed boots do nothing to quiet generational alchemy. Even, as the, even with the 70-pound cotton gin fan tied round my neck, I found it simple to soar. And I am seven again, and I am convinced if I try hard enough, I can spin myself to space, or I am three, and there is only daddy and me, and when he throws my body towards God, there is no ceiling, and when those men pull out that pistol, nothing can hurt me. On the day I bought a toy pistol to a gunfight, I counted all the games I was best at. Basketball, Monopoly, never wearing a hoodie, not sagging my pants too low, catching popcorn in my mouth, identifying dinosaurs, no sudden movements, no backtalk boy, no loitering boy, hands up boy, hands up boy, I can't breathe in this endlessness. I can't breathe over the hot breath of a uniform on my neck. I can't breathe and neither could my father and his daddy and his daddy. I can't breathe with your robe around my throat. We haven't taken a breath in centuries more. I can't breathe when I'm thug, gangster, nigger, spook. We can't breathe. Why the fuck should you? On the day I got my brother some skills and an iced tea for me, I was on the phone. I could never do one thing only. I always had to be working double. I should have hung up sooner. I didn't want anyone to hear me scream. I didn't want her to hear the ears full of silence after the screams, what the ending speaks of. On the day I took a BART train to my final destination, I glanced out the window, and in the speeding lights, I watched my daughter grow. Watched it all, graduation, wedding, grandbabies. The brightness and hopefulness of it all left me nearly blinded. I shaded my watering eyes, and I couldn't wait to see it all in real time. I had no idea what the ending would speak of. She's going to bend me at the knees. 
She's going to make me wish these butterflies or wishes. I wish for you to be mine a million different times because what I am is absolutely yours. Every day I'm waiting until I can hear you call my name. And okay, I know you're Polly, but I think that my name should be the only name you ever say. <laughs> Nobody says it like you. Nobody does anything quite like you. I want to know where you come from. I want to know who gave you those dimples. And I want to know who you smile like and where you learn to laugh like that with your whole body filling up the whole room. I want to know why you never curse and who taught you those good Midwestern manners. <laughs> Take them to your hometown. Show me where your father showed you how to ride a bike and where you kissed a boy and realized that you didn't like it. <laughs> Take me where I can kiss you under stars you can actually see. I want to shake your mama's hand while you tell her we're just really close friends. <laughs> Mother, I want to sleep in your childhood bed. I want to lay staring at the same walls you spent so many nights staring at. I wish I knew you then, so I could tell you you turn out just fine, that you never lack for young, moonstruck girls who will write you love poems, tuck, you, tuck them into your pockets before you go. I want to hear how you feel about me. I don't want any of that bullshit about too much too soon to come between me and you. I want to know what goes on in your body when you see me running to you, tripping on my own two feet, getting with the possibility that you may want me as much as I want you, woman. You are so fucking handsome. And my favorite thing about the way you look is that it is the least interesting thing about you. Tell me everything. I want to swing from your tongue. Touch me everywhere. Play my ribs like a well-loved instrument. You probably already know this but there's nothing like hearing it again and again. You are everything I have ever wanted. Wow.
I went to see the shark. <laughs> Amazed, even. I'm like, fantasy turned reality. Hmm. We climbed the stairwell to my loft. Lights went out, and I'll say nothing more. <laughs> So this next one is a, a really brief poem. When I was young, I trusted people to be kind and understanding. I was a child. When I was young, they ravaged my soul. They lied. And I was a child. When I was young, I buried myself in the warm summer sand. And I was a child. So this next one, I entitled Infinity lust, love, and the underbelly of the liquid feminine. We all like to dream. We've all dreamed before, right? Sometimes the dreams go so deep that you don't know where they're going to lead you. One time I was dreaming, and it started off like any normal dream. You get drowsy, you start to fall asleep, you go into that REM sleep, and then, damn, before you know it, the dream takes over. And I find myself slipping into a sea of liquid feminine. Slipping, twirling, moving with the current. And all of a sudden, I find myself being chased by mermaid lesbians. <laughs> of course, I had a bit of fear going on. <laughs> then I, so, deeper and deeper into the caverns and I come up against Poseidon's staff and that is scary <laughs> because he tells me it's time to make a choice in your life. One side of the coin or the other. You need to choose. And of course, I'm still buried in the belly of the liquid feminine of lust, love, and infinity. I wake up and I have made my choice. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much for that. Everyone, let's let's give another round of welcome for Thomas, please. Thank you so much for sharing. Yay, Thomas. All right, so um, is anyone out here in the audience, does anyone else would like to share with us um, a story about yourself? Uh, maybe a story about uh, what happened to you today or last week? Maybe something that um, is troubling you with the state of affairs. Anyone? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. All right, come on up. Woo. We're going to give you about five to seven minutes. How's that? Okay, that sounds good. What is your name? I'm Kyle. What's that? I'm Kyle. Say hello to
because um, I was at work and my partner uh, texted me saying that they were at Golden Gate Park and they had just taken some shrooms that I had gifted to them <laughs> with my dog. And I was like, oh my God, this is really not gonna be okay. I don't know how this is gonna go because you took a lot. <laughs> Um, and so anyway, like two hours later, they called me and they were like, hey, can you please, can you meet up with us? And I was like, oh shit, yeah, absolutely. Left work, took a lift, took a taxi actually, um, which is like way more expensive. And I was like, I got you. So I got there and it's all good. Everything ended up being like super awesome and super sweet. Um, so this is some like ridiculous shit I wrote after I took my, uh, my dose. Of course, 
uh, there's no asylum anymore, so there's nowhere to go. So yeah, it's, uh, so they have to sneak out of the country and stuff. So. Anyway, thank you. Bless all of you. Well, thank you so much, Severin. Yes, you get up there. That's right. We definitely can't forget the struggles of our community members, our international community members as well, right? Yeah. It's interesting how it seems seems like uh, this type of sediment is going past the U.S., which really is not a good thing. I mean, a lot of people tend to come here, right, to find um, a safe place and. Uh, for a while there, it seems like a lot of these countries were being more open and changing their views and their laws. Um, and it just, it's really sad to hear that in just a matter of like one politician, things could change so much. Yeah. Um, so, would anyone else like to share? Is it Scotty? Great, thank you. Come on up, Scotty. This is um, the Gateway Writers here. Uh, an intergenerational discussion with them. It was really beautiful. Um, they've been a group now for about four years up at Open House. Gay Gray Writers. If anyone here is a gay gray writer and is interested, um, they meet, I want to say, every other week at Open House. Um, but one of the stories, the last story, that really taught me a lot and it really got to me. Um, the gentleman was talking, uh, telling a story about uh, a gentleman that was, again, somewhere like in the 50s, where um, he was over at Macy's um, and went into the men's bathroom and uh, noticed there was an older gentleman there. And the this, this person that walked in, he was 18 years old at that time. And he walked in and he saw this older gentleman at the urinal. And when he went up to um, use the urinal next to him, they looked at each other. Uh, and then, um, you know, they started having relations with each other, and just as they started, all of a sudden the cops came in and busted them. And um, it, you know, it was really intense because back in those days, as Scott was saying, you know, um, being a homosexual, it was definitely against the law. Uh, people definitely did not care, um, you know, for people that were in love with people of the same sex. Um, and it seemed like the police were doing all these sting operations, right, to try to catch people, right, in these criminal acts. And that was a sting operation, and they got caught, and they took him to jail, and, you know, they were trying to make him confess, make him confess, make him confess, and he, he wouldn't do it, you know, like, well, he told him, yes, I went in there, yes, it was consensual, but he wouldn't sign the document that basically stated that, you know, he did these acts, these homosexual acts, because he knew that if he signed the paperwork, right, that his life would be ruined, right? And I have to say that, you know, I never knew that any of that stuff happened. This was definitely way before my time. And um, it was just really sad to hear because 18 years old, right, one bad choice, because not to say that, you know, I mean, what they were doing, the act isn't bad, but his choice to do that in a public place, right? And um, three years later, he was driving, and they stopped him just on, like, a traffic infraction, and they ran his name, right, his ID, and there was a warrant out for his arrest because he hadn't signed that paper. So they took him in and the cops like beat him up and literally forced him to sign these papers. And then all of a sudden he became this pedophile that had to you know, go and check in once a year on his birthday. And I was just astonished because, you know, there's nothing wrong with this person, right? There's no mental health. He's not a pedophile. Um, he, he's not a rapist, right? And every year of his life, he had to go to the um, police station and register as a sex offender. 
and that literally destroyed, destroyed his whole life. You know, he had a hard time finding a job, you know, couldn't finish his schooling, um, just really couldn't get started in his, in his life. And I, you know, I, I just, I never thought of, you know, how something like that can really impact someone, and especially like their whole entire life, right? Um, and the moral of the story after he told us that whole story was just to say, you know, next time you're in the mission, go into your favorite restaurant or checking out that new, you know, restaurant that just opened up. If you happen to see an older gentleman, you know, with a cane or in a wheelchair or in a mobile chair, you know, just acknowledge him. You know, say hello. Um, let him know that you see him, you know? And again, from what Scotty was saying, you know, that the time that he learned to not judge people, you know, it's like we, you know, for us, sometimes we're so busy and, you know, we see people in the corner of our eye and we just kind of like decide to, oh, you know, they're not relevant or, you know, they're not part of my life, so I don't really see them, you know, just, take that extra step or that extra time just to say hello because we don't know what they're going through or what they were going through or, you know, what situation got them to the point where, you know, unfortunately they weren't able to evolve in their life, um, you know, like a lot of us have and a lot of us will with all this support, right? Because back then there wasn't much support. Um, yeah, so I, I just, you know, thank you so much, Scotty, for sharing with us and, um, I was really fortunate enough to, to do that A grade writers group and listen to that story because now when I'm walking up and down Mission Street, I'm definitely going to think twice about you know the different people that are on the sidewalk. Um, and that being said, I think Thomas said he's got one more story for us. So maybe all right, so we can welcome Thomas back up to the stage. Yeah, he was ready. Oh, you want to grab one? Why don't they give you this one? Oh. So, first of all, we have acronyms in our lives, like LOL, what is that one? Like? Oh, wow. Great. ADD. Attention deficit disorder. No. Another dating disaster. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sit down for this one. That's right. <laughs> so, Cupid in search of a partner. Probably 30 years ago again, when the world was simple. <laughs> I'm right. At a time when the personal ads were in the newspaper and we were not doing Craigslist. Right? Yeah. Right? Uh, and some of us are guilty of both. <laughs> uh, anyway, I answered an ad. And the person came over. We talked. He had told me that he was married and had a child. I'm like, well, I'm not sure if I could handle that kind of relationship or be responsible for having break up a marriage or have a very angry woman come after me with a knife. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent that person on his way. And I, but I also said, we live in such a small town. I know a lot of people. And uh, with that said, I forgot about that person. About two years later, I was working the um, Gay Pride in San Luis Obispo, helping out as my usual kind-hearted self as a volunteer, and this person came up to me and said, do you remember me? He goes, I am the guy who came to visit you who had a wife and daughter. 
And I said, yes. And he goes, I no longer have a wife and daughter. <laughs> and I said, oh? He goes, my wife outed me. And I said, how did you get caught? He goes, she found the mailbox key with letters that I had been receiving from other men. She set up a fake sting in a restaurant and outed me. Now I'm happily married to my partner, Jonathan. <laughs> so, one more brief story about dating, and this one I call Blind Date. Uh, I answered another ad. His name was Scotty. And I explained that too many people knew me in town. We should go away for the weekend. Let's go to Santa Cruz. My friend has a place in Santa Cruz. You'll have to drive. I can't drive, but you'll have to drive. And so he agreed. He came by, picked me up. We went down the 101, talking, laughing, getting used to each other, you know, and, and I would occasionally say, so, when was the last time you went on a blind date? And, and he goes, well, oh, it's been a while. We got to our destination, and my friend Donnie said, has he asked to drive your vehicle yet? No, don't let him, he's blind. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. All right. So before we go, um, I want to, you know, I want to bring Anna Allen back up. Um, more than anything, it's just so that we can praise her again for such beautiful poetry. And then I'd also like to commend her with the $150 for the I believe that I'm not. Thank you so much for sharing your life, sharing your story, and your emotions. I'm going to leave you there. Thank you so much.
started an organization in 1979. But prior to that, he started an organization in 1950. Uh, the man's name was Harry Day. And in 1950, he started the Madison Society. And um, I would initially run into him in an incredible uh, movie that PBS aired that also was shown initially at the Castro Theater uh, called the Word is Out. And Harry Hay and his partner, John Burnside, was in this incredible documentary. Um, years later, um, a book had come out about him in 1990. And then in 93, or actually in 94, I had the chance of running into Harry Hay on, on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard when I was living in Los Angeles. And just was like, oh my god, I didn't think that's Harry Hay. And Harry Hay took me to a radical theory um, uh, Heart circle, and we discussed how we would interact with um, LA Pride, which was uh, held in West Hollywood at that, at that point. Um, and about a year later or so, I was saying goodbye to Harry, and he did something to me which kind of put me off because at that point, Harry was about 84. Um, people that know me well know that I am often with, I meet lots of younger men. And I went to say goodbye to Harry and kissed him on, on, the, on, the, on the lips. And this time, Harry pushed his tongue to my mouth. And I was like, um, hey, gosh, um, that's some. Um. But then I stopped and thought about who was pushing their tongue to my mouth. You know? And it was like this guy I'd known for a year that I really liked a lot. And I knew that he loved me, and I trusted him. And the guy that I met the weekend before at some bar or something, I had no idea what his name was. And we did a lot more than like just a ton of things. <laughs> so um, I walked away and I came up with this like, like new way of thinking about intimacy, loving, sharing with people. And then I moved back to San Francisco in 96. I was away for six years. And Mr. A came up to a different life with now Dogger Books in Castro Street to read from a, a book of writings of his. And afterwards, I walked up to Harry Day and I said, I want to apologize for my lack of reciprocation. And I leaned toward this man who was 85 or 86 at the time, and I put my lips against his lips and shoved my tongue in his mouth, and we just went at it. <laughs> Every time I ran into Harry Day afterwards, the same thing happened. I would see him at a party, I'd go right up to him and start tongue kissing him. Uh, something which I learned about 89 year olds was when I approached him at a dance performance, he was sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, a man named Joe Goodes, a dance company in San Francisco, had produced a, uh, a dance performance called Undertaking Harry. And there was Harry Day in a wheelchair an oxygen tank next to it, and I walked up, pushed my tongue to his mouth. Uh, we did the same thing as normal, and then at the end of the month, which was Gay Pride Day, I walked up to his car at the Pride Celebration, attempted to kiss him. He stopped me and pointed towards the window and said, petting zoo only. <laughs> so I leaned forward, and I petted him, and then I, I, I turned to somebody else and said, what's going on? And they said, well, at the beginning of this month, he went to a dance performance. After the dance performance, he went into ICU for about a week and almost died. And I'm like, oh, what happened? Well, s someone passed him a bug that didn't affect their younger 47-year-old body, but did affect this 89-year-old man and put him in ICU. And I'm like, and I made the space, and I'm like, we know it was you. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so a year later at this building, when he was celebrating his 90th birthday, that year he died. And he was sitting on a stage. There was this long line of people, Gilbert Baker who made the rainbow flag, Dennis Brown who fought for marijuana rights in California for many years. Tons of people were here. And I was like, I don't understand this long line. And I saw his lovely partner of 40 years, John Burnside, sitting behind him. And I went up to John and I said, hi John. And John, Harry had a bit of a problem with 
here. And John Lennon was scary much mine, so it was really easy to converse with John Burnside. And I was like, hey, John. And he was like, hey, Bruce. And I was like, it's great to see you. And he said, I just want to share something with you. Harry really misses your deep kisses. <laughs> and I was like, John, <laughs> wow, well, like, you know, like, one of the people that started, you know, fighting for our rights in America was concerned about not being able to tongue kiss me anymore. And <laughs> so, you know, find some 89 year old and kiss them and make sure that they're healthy enough to stay, you know, to take your kiss. <laughs>